Rangers are a hugely successful Scottish club. Now, I know this isn't news to anyone, but it does mean that Rangers get a first-hand look at the best talent on offer in the Scottish leagues. Talent that Rangers have throughout the years brought in to add to that success. And yet, whenever Rangers are linked with a player who plies his trade in Scotland, there are always dissenting voices who dismiss them as being unable to make the step up, usually trotting out the well-worn line about not being Rangers class. And yet, so many of our heroes played their football with the also-rans of the Scottish game. So today's list is all about those players who made the step up and proved that they did belong. The list isn't necessarily to say who was the better player, but instead looks at the impact of the signing to the team both short term and long term, with value for money also taken into account, but not an overriding factor. You're watching Top 10 Rangers, and this is the 10 best Rangers domestic signings since the Advocat era. The Dundee side of the early 2000s was a popular market for Rangers at the time as the likes of Zurab Kizanishvili and Gavin Ray found themselves at Ibrox. But the first and certainly most successful transfer from that period was Claudio Canigia. At 33 years of age and after a, shall we say, colourful career, the Argentinian had been lighting up the league for the Dens Park side, running at defenders like a man 10 years younger as he helped them to a rare top 6 finish, and in doing so attracted the interest of both Rangers and Celtic. Ibrox would be Kanija's destination in May after his single season on Tayside. Another year older yet still showing no signs of slowing down, scoring 9 goals in his first season as Rangers claimed a cup double, and despite turning 35 during the following campaign, his 12 goals, including 6 across all competitions against Dunfermline alone, played a crucial part in Rangers' last domestic treble to date. His performances in his two-year spell at Ibrox earned him a place in Marco Bielsa's Argentina team for the 2002 World Cup, which was a fitting reward for his contributions to Rangers. We won't spend too much time on this one as he isn't exactly the most welcome at Ibrox these days, but no matter what has transpired since, it is impossible to deny the signing of Stephen Naismith from Kilmarnock in the dying seconds of the summer transfer window was a good one. With steely determination and a football brain to go with it, Naismith became a bigger part of Walter Smith's three in a row side with each passing season, as he brought excellent movement and a goal threat to whatever position he was asked to play in. 33 goals and 98 appearances that brought three back-to-back -back league winners medals and a further three cup medals should see him considered a Rangers great, but few at this point are ready to forgive the kick he and fellow persona non grata Stephen Whitaker gave the club and the fans at the lowest point. Shame really. Fittingly after our last entry, now we have a man whose actions in Rangers' darkest hour will be forever remembered by fans. Signing from Hearts for around £1.5 million in 2011, Lee Wallace had a solid first year at Rangers, notably playing a massive part in Rangers' defiant last stand to stop Celtic winning the title at Ibrox, in what would be the last Premier League old firm at Ibrox for a number of years. Fans mostly didn't genuinely expect top level players to remain at Rangers while the club faced the long road back to Scotland's top flight, particularly those who were at or approaching the peak of their career who risked stagnating in the lower leagues of Scotland. While others such as Neil Alexander and Lee McCulloch deserve all the gratitude in the world for staying for the fight, Wallace requires special mention in that regard. Having only been at the club for one season, Lee Wallace owed Rangers nothing and as a 24-year-old internationally capped left-back, could easily have found himself a move as others had. Wallace however remained and as vice-captain and later captain, helped steer the club back towards where they belonged over the next four years. His relentless overlapping runs seen him named PFA Player of the Season in each of Rangers' three promotion winning campaigns.
try and tell me you didn't smile when you heard the name Marvin Andrews. The reason you can't do it is that the infectious joy he brought with him when he arrived from Livingston in 2004 is just too much not to love Big Marv. As a defender he was quicker than his hulking frame would indicate and though not exactly the most cultured football and centre half Rangers have ever had, he's certainly a contender for the bravest. Often putting his head where others feared to and winning the ball cleanly. That of course pales in comparison to him waving his insurance to play through a cruciate knee ligament injury during a title run-in. Yes, a cruciate knee ligament injury that would normally require surgery and a lengthy layoff wasn't enough to stop Marvin Andrews, as the defender relied on his faith to keep him safe as he played his part in Rangers' miraculous title win on Helicopter Sunday. It would be fair to say that Aberdeen fans weren't best pleased when their captain, who had been at the club since 8 years old, grabbed the opportunity to sign for Rangers on a free transfer in 2017. They were probably even less pleased to hear Ryan Jack say how much of an honour and a privilege it was to sign for the club he supported as a boy. Jack's first season at Ibrox was somewhat of a mixed bag. His individual performances were impressive, rarely losing the ball and showing an incredible knack for picking up loose balls in the middle. But the team overall struggled under new boss Pedro Caixinha's incompetence and though Jack did an admirable job in the engine room, being played in a midfield two alongside a struggling Graham Dorrance was a massive ask, and some truly shocking refereeing decisions saw him ordered off four times before injury ended his debut campaign in blue. The arrival of Steven Gerrard took Rangers and Jack to the next level, and will let Steven Gerrard's words make clear how important Ryan Jack has been to that evolution. Ryan has helped us take the standards where we want them to be because of his own personal drive and how he approaches training and games. If you could sum up Ryan Jack in one word, he is a winner, and I want winners around me closely. Speaking of Jack's desire, and Gerard added further, it doesn't matter if it's 5 asides or an 11 aside at Celtic Park, he wants to win. That a player of Glen Kamara's clear quality ended up at Dundee is surprising enough. But a player of Glen Kamara's quality being frozen out of a doomed to be relegated Dundee side is absolutely mind boggling. With six months remaining on his Dens Park deal, Rangers were more than happy to hand over the £50,000 to sign him in January of 2018, rather than waiting until the summer. Dundee and their wisdom were relegated and Kamara has shone on the European and international stage. <laughs> and people wonder why such a well-run club couldn't send an email properly. Showing a level of composure and poise on the ball that allows him to receive it under pressure and stride away from opposition players in midfield. Kamara has only gotten better and better under Steven Gerrard, as the Finnish international has tightened up his game and bulked up his physique. To the point that the man who once found himself on the Dundee sidelines wouldn't look out of place in any of Europe's top leagues if and when he decides to leave Ibrox. Should that happen, there's every chance that Rangers will net the biggest ever transfer profit for a player that has helped take them up a level in his time at the club, further making a mockery of the ridiculous £50,000 price tag. It sounds bizarre to say it now considering the difference in class and character shown between the two since. But at one point Kevin Thompson and Scott Brown appeared to be inseparable. Heading into the January 2007 transfer window, the pair seemed to be a package deal, with West Brom, Rangers and Celtic all keen to rescue the pair from then Hibs manager, six pack flashing John Collins. Celtic had even reportedly agreed a £5.5 million deal for the duo, but Thompson would split from his former flatmate to sign for Walter Smith's Rangers for £2 million, while Brown would end up at Parkhead in the summer for £4.6 million, though it wouldn't take long for Rangers fans to realise that they had signed twice the player for half the price. 
Thompson was a perfect fit for Rangers. As the man said himself, the Rangers style suited my game to a T. Everything that the Rangers DNA is made up of, I like to think is me as a person. His combative style was the perfect foil for creative players in the team like Pedro Mendes and Steven Davis. Don't get me wrong, his game was far more than just well-timed tackles. He could drive a pass into feet from midfield as well as anyone in the team, but it was his positional discipline and robust challenges that made him a must for big games. His old firm record stands testament to that, going unbeaten in his first six appearances in the fixture, while Rangers noticeably missed him when he was ruled out. Ignoring everything I've just said, he'd still likely find himself high on this list for the thundering and tone-setting challenges on Robbie Keane, as Rangers all but wrapped up a second title and a fifth winner's medal for Thompson. When Rangers shelled out £2 million for Hearts winger Neil McCann in late 1998, the strikers at the club must have been licking their lips. McCann had only months before helped Hearts lift the Scottish Cup, the first major trophy since the early 60s. An old school Scottish winger who fullbacks up and down the country must have seen in their nightmares, McCann would quadruple his medal haul by the end of his first six months at Ibrox, as he helped his new side complete a domestic clean sweep famously bagging himself a brace at Celtic Park, as Rangers clinched the league title at the home of their rivals. Pace and trickery are valuable assets in football, but they can often mean nothing without a quality delivery into the box. McCann though specialised in beating his man on the outside and whipping across into a dangerous area with a number of iconic Rangers goals of the era being the end product. Finishing his Rangers career in the same manner it started, McCann's pivotal role in Rangers' last day goal difference title win in 2003, and cross for Amoruso's winner in the following week's Scottish Cup final signed off a great Rangers career with a second treble. Nacho Novo's 25 goals for 7th place Dundee, including 4 in the UEFA Cup, drew the attention of the top two sides in Scotland. Celtic's £500,000 offer was the first to be accepted, but Nacho supposedly didn't show the necessary level of commitment to signing on at Parkhead. In other words, he said no thanks. Telling Dundee that if Rangers' lesser offer wasn't accepted, then an injury would likely keep him on the sidelines until the end of his deal might not be the best way to exit a club on good terms, but when your heart lies at Ibrox, who among us could say that they wouldn't have done the same? Finally getting the movie was after for a reported £450,000. An injury-free Novo would net 25 goals in its debut season, including the final day winner at Easter Road, as Rangers clinched a shock title on Helicopter Sunday. Though much of his Rangers career from then on would see him in and out of the starting lineup and fighting for a place as an impact sub, the lasting impact of Nacho Novo's contributions are staggering when you lay them out together. A late goal against Red Star Belgrade that saw Rangers through to the land of milk and money that is the Champions League, a crucial late goal in Athens on the road to Manchester, a stunning Scottish Cup final winner seconds after entering the field and netting the winning penalty in Florence that sent Rangers to the only European final many of us will ever have seen Rangers reach. Nacho Novo's effort and love of the club make him a cult hero among fans, but the big moments he gave us go beyond that into the realms of legendary. After a red-hot start to the 2005-2006 season for Kilmarnock, that saw him rack up 17 goals from 20 games. Rangers paid £400,000 for the country's informed striker come January, and Boyd picked up at Ibrox exactly where he left off for the Rugby Park side, becoming the first Rangers player since Colin Steen to bag a hat-trick on his debut, and netting 20 goals in 21 games in the second half of the season to become the only man to finish as top scorer for two clubs in one season. 
The goal machine would then hit upwards of 25 goals in each of his four full seasons at the club, and only once failed to finish the season as the most lethal striker in Scotland. The endless debates of the time about whether Boyd justified his place on the side seemed reasonable enough considering how often he would find himself on the bench for the big games. But in the years since, the flat track bully criticism thrown his way seems ridiculous. Considering that until Steven Gerrard's invincible side blew apart anyone who faced them, Rangers had so often come unstuck in the games they were expected to win, but failed to take their chances. Even if he wasn't the world's most technically gifted player, Chris Boyd's goals brought Rangers silverware. His predatory instincts making the difference as Rangers twice came from behind against Dundee United before completing the fairy tale by scoring the winning penalty in the shootout, and his remarkable 50 league goals across the first two title wins of Walter Smith's three in a row were the difference between being champions or runners up. And should serve as a reminder sometimes football is as simple as just putting the ball in the net. And in that regard, nobody did it better than Boydie.